I want to talk about what it is to be hard of hearing and uh, and also a, mu a musician, a, a performer, a writer, composer, you know. I thought I would uh, take a bit and tell my story, how I became hard of hearing. Um, and in retrospect, how I think that it has influenced or impacted the way I write music, the way I interact with the world in in general, but specifically about writing music um, and the kind of music that I write and the kind of music that I like to listen to, because there are some interesting uh, outcomes that maybe at the time I wasn't necessarily aware of. One of the things that sort of struck me is that um, my compositional style, particularly in electronic music, but, but also in piano or um, chamber music, has done two things. Again, this is all on reflection looking back over the last 20 years. Um, I write music that sounds like what I hear. Um, so just to f give some context, I'm uh, completely deaf in my right ear and I am um, I have partial hearing in my left ear. Both of those are the result of uh, surgical interventions to remove uh, tumors, uh, acoustic neuromas, bilateral acoustic neuroma. And uh, the diagnosis was quite late for the, f for the first one. And I was in my mid thirties, maybe. Um, with severe tinnitus, which we all do, um, right? And uh, I went to a general practitioner, um, primary care doctor here, and said, "Hey, I've got, I've got ringing in my ear. Is there anything we can do about it?" And um, he sort of looked at me and said, "Well, you're you're 30 years old. You you're in pretty good health." You've, you've just been listening to too much loud music. And I um, really wanted to just leave it at that. But something, this is one of those moments in my life where I look and think um, I was impelled towards action by some part of me that is not normally active. Because normally I would say, that's great, I'll see you. But instead I said, no, nah, I think I'd like to have someone take just a bit more of a look than, than that. And so he gave me the name of a specialist. I went to see that specialist maybe a month later. Um, and very quickly they died. They did a, an initial scan and very quickly identified that there was some balance issues as well as some hearing issues that were most likely caused by uh, an acoustic neuroma. I went down for an MRI scan that day and they identified quite a large growth, which was then surgically removed. But because it was so large, there was no way to really save any of the auditory or vestibular, the balanced nerves. So that all came out, that was quite successful, uh, but left me deaf in, in the side. But you know, that's the kind of thing that you can adapt to. It's hard to tell where sounds come from. Um, But, but other than that, you know, uh, and there was some there was some balance adjustment, but there was another set of nerves over here that could um, uh, that could compensate. But what I noticed, because I was writing music in the studio, electronic music in my twenties, and I, in retrospect, I remember one conversation in particular. I was working on something in the university studio, and someone walked over, walked in, and listened to what I was doing. They said, that's a really interesting choice. They said uh, that you've mixed everything heavily to the right. And I, I, don't know, I don't know what you're talking because I was mixing with headsets. Of course, 
I had been losing hearing in my right side without really knowing it for years before the surgery and um, not knowing what I was doing. I was compensating in the mix by boosting the boosting the right. So I had written music that was um, mixed over to the right. And I also was writing music that was uh, very concentrated in upper frequencies. And, and I did that, I think, for, for two reasons. First, because those were the frequencies that were failing. So part of it was to adjust. But I think more than that, and more consistently, I have written music that recreates the sound that I hear. So I'm going to go downstairs and do a bit that says, what does it sound like? There's sort of a constant whooshing sound that uh, it comes and goes, but it sort of sounds like running water, on and off, and on and off. And then on top of that is the tinnitus itself, which is, um, but for me more often it's as if a ring finger is tapping okay. If I play some music, Since the surgery, uh, my tinnitus has become much more extreme and constant. Uh, and added into then the results of the second surgery, so then you jump forward four or five years, and a second neuroma was identified on the left side, which at this point was my only only hearing ear. So the, the risk there was much, much higher. Um, these surgeries are not risk free. It is brain surgery and the risk of damaging the nerve is quite high. So there's a 20% chance that removing the tumor will destroy the nerve. And there's uh, uh, 80% chance that in removing the tumor, the hearing will be damaged somehow, which is what happened to me. Uh, you know, I had that moment where I pushed back a little bit on my doctor and said I wanted to have someone look at it. If I hadn't done that, I would have been three or four years later, that big tumor would have put, started to push against the brain more than it was, and I would have fallen into a coma. And... Uh, Everything since then has been grace and, and and a gift of a gift of time, which I remind myself of quite frequently, um, because I'm 55 now. Uh, so wh when I woke up from the second surgery and I could hear my surgeon. Um, poorly, but I could hear him, and and I could see him see that I could hear him. That was an intense moment. But the nerve was was damaged, and it damaged in a way that uh, I have significant frequency loss in a sort of bizarre pattern that shows up when I hear new pieces of music. It sounds like it's coming through a 
shitty transistor radio with odd equalization on it and, and low volume. When I first meet a person, someone I'd not met before, or hear a voice for the first time, they sound like they have a lisp. But, but that doesn't last because one of the bizarre things that I have accommodated and learned about the brain is that the brain will fill in space. So there's frequency damage in my, in my ear. The truth of it is that that means that certain frequencies are not present. So when someone speaks, the frequency's on there and it sounds like a, a lisp, like a shh, 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 shh. It's not a lisp, but you know what I mean, there's a, but my brain knows what a voice is supposed to sound like. And after a few hours of listening to someone, the voice becomes normal. It's weird, right? Isn't it weird what the brain does? The tinnitus is kind of like, tinnitus is phantom sound, where the brain doesn't know what to replace. It just creates sound to fill in the gaps of what's, of what's there. Um, when I first came home from that second surgery and I sat down and played a note on the piano, uh, it sounded like the music that I write with my ring modulator on the piano. Back now, but I think the reason that I write that kind of music, why I spend all of that time figuring out how to create a, a pedal construct on the piano, is because that is what my brain is actually hearing. Now, again, after a bit of time, I don't hear that on the piano anymore. My brain filled in the sound and continues to. But I know that what I'm listening to isn't what I'm hearing, or however you want to break it. What I'm hearing isn't what I'm listening to. I know that my brain is modifying the sound as it comes in before I cognize it. I know that. I think the reason that I write music with this ring modulated halo around it is because that's what's really happening. Anyway, there's a recurrence on um, the right side. So in, uh, in a week, I'm going to be going back into the hospital and have it taken out. And it's all going to be fine. It's going to be a bit, it's a rough recovery. But again, because this was the side that was most, most damaged, you know, there's nothing left here. To, to, assuming that the brain resection or whatever they do, it, takes works okay which it will they're very good at this um, there shouldn't be a long-term shift I say that there's always a long-term shift this this will be the fourth surgery I've gone through for this to address these tumors one was in my chest um, and then now the third in my in my head and uh, um, it's just getting a bit old, isn't it? But at least I get to get old, right? It's amazing how they do this. When they've taken the tumor out, they, they cut out a piece of belly fat and slap it in the brain, in the head here, as a way of preventing infection. It's one of the main causes of surgical mortality before they did that was um, brain fluid leakage and infection 
And they found that packing in a bunch of the body's own fat kept everything in place. Isn't that amazing? Who first thought of that? Like that? That's wild. <laughs>